Interesting TV evangelists and tax law, welcome to Leaving Hillsong. Welcome back if you're a regular and if it's your first time, we are here digging through documents, so you may as well jump on in. My name's Tanya and I'm so happy to have you alongside this conversation. Come on in, grab your snacks, pull up a chair, have an opinion. It's a great time to have a look at Leaving Hillsong. It's a fascinating look at this, it it seems, untouchable world of the TV evangelist. And we specifically focus here, world of these men of God, they call themselves, and there seems to just be no parameters, like no rules or regulations and the ones that are there don't seem to be enforced very well and we talked yesterday about the kind of local laws and the ways these guys kind of funnel all this money into their own charities just to prop themselves up and they do what they like with the money and tax evasion or no tax evasion laundering fraud I mean what's going to happen In any case, I was lucky enough to get Barry Bowen to agree to chat with us. He's an accountant by trade. He's had a a lot of different roles, but he's been an activist for a long time. And he's been researching TV evangelists and, you know, he studies jet travel on the side. He uh, knows where they're going (laughs) and uh, what they're doing. Not exactly sure what we can do about it, but it's very interesting that we can now, due to these whistleblower documents, have a much closer look at what's actually going on. The Australian law stuff was kind of hard enough for me to get my head around, and these guys are travelling and sharing these honorariums, honoraria, with each other and just moving all this money around the world. Now I'm here on this island. Barry's in Texas. He works for the Trinity Foundation. They've been around for a very long time, digging up and exposing these people. And you can only imagine the excess in the United States, and Barry's all across it. He writes the most thorough and detailed articles with such wise explanations. So he's come along to explain to us... uh, what happens when these people go overseas? What the birthday party is like there? So please welcome back Barry Bowen for a giant birthday party, part two. Okay. Hi, Barry. Thank you so much. It's so good to have you back. It's so exciting. Thanks for joining us. Oh, the pleasure is mine. Glad to talk to you again. <laughs> um it's been a while since we have talked yeah and a lot has happened since then i guess most notably the the drop of those documents you've been uh having a look around them having a bit of a a field day there right like it's it's fascinating it's like putting together a the a big puzzle and we've got numerous pizza um piece pieces to work with i was about to say pizzas to work with exactly there are so many clues to what's going on in Hillsong when you examine the financial information. There's auditor notes, which are fascinating, which explain in detail the strategy of 
the Hillsong Limited Liability Companies and how they operate. There's activity which looks plainly illegal. I mean, there's all kinds of red flags. It's very clear that Hillsong has failed at church governance, that um, yeah. people are operating without integrity in the organization. Some of those people are gone, um, but it will take a big change in Hillsong culture to restore credibility, which they may have really have had it to begin with. They may have just been assumed. Yeah, I, I think you've got that 100, 100% correct. There's, there's so much we could talk about. Let's, um, let's just jump quickly to, I know you've kindly listened to that audio just before from the source. I mean, you know, can you can you help us out with the other side of the coin, uh, you know, the other side of the world? You know, what what is the story with the taxes and the honorariums and taxes and international speaking circuits and stuff? How does it work on your side? In the United States, the laws, I think they are in some ways better than some of the Australian laws um, when it comes to gifts. Oh, I mean, there's... Could it get worse? Anyway, sorry. There is a clear limit on what can be given as a gift. Anything that goes over that threshold is taxable. A church or a charity or, or for corporate? Correct. How does that... um, the gift tax annual exclusion is what it's called in the United States. For example, from 2018 to 2021, the gift tax exclusion was $15,000. If a gift was less than $15,000, it was not taxable. That's really high. That's cool. okay. and, but as far as I understand, Australia doesn't really have a limit. I mean... Yeah, I just, yeah, I kept asking him, like, but what's the limit? And he's like, no, that's it. You just tell George or something. <laughs> yeah, I looked at the Australian Tax Authority's website about gifts and it was just shocking to me how there is not a threshold for what is appropriate if you go beyond a certain amount in the united states it's taxable it should be reported on a, a tax form that's how the united okay. states handles it now th there are a variety of i think exceptions i think for example if someone has very large health expenses you can go beyond the fifteen thousand dollars paying someone oh. else's health, health insurance um, not uh, life insurance health. but <laughs> medical bill treatment. from a hospital mm -hmm. okay right not just like uh, a five thousand dollar medical clinic up the road for some reason for physician okay so this really stands out to you then well normally we do not have this kind of financial information available Churches are not required to file 990s with the IRS. So in the United States, we have a tax form, or informational form, not a tax form. It's called a 990. Nonprofits are required to file it with the IRS. It, it discloses total revenue, total expenses, uh, compensation for highly compensated employees. There's a breakdown of expenses page. It's wealth of information. But churches, synagogues, and mosques are exempt from filing. So because churches don't file, you don't know when diversion of assets takes place. And in the United States, in the nonprofit tax code, um, the rules for nonprofit organizations, it prohibits inurement. You're not supposed to be self-enriched from the assets of the nonprofit organization. That's illegal. Okay. You can get paid a fair rate, fair salary, but there's penalties if you go over certain amounts. For example, there are a million dollars for a regular nonprofit. If you give a person over a million dollars, it generally needs to be reported and then it can be taxed. That's called excessive compensation. Unfortunately, there are loopholes. Church ministers are exempt from that and okay. people that are independent contractors that they're paid over a million dollars to a nonprofit again that's exempt uh, which is really crazy to me there are attorneys that work for nonprofit organizations that are probably paid over a million dollars and that's not disclosed on the 990s so you don't know donors don't know how much of the money is going to attorneys pockets the perfect example of that would be Jay Seculo 
He heads up an organization, American Center for Law and Justice. He has a separate law firm, Constitutional Litigation and Advocacy Group, which over, I think over $6 million from American Center for Law and Justice went to his law firm. I mean, how much did he get paid from that? We don't know because they're not disclosing it on a 990. I consider that an incomplete 990. They actually file one and they just don't provide the information. But when we look at um, Hillsong, Hillsong does not file a 990. What do you mean? They do not report. I mean, they have an annual report, but it's like the cliff notes of financial information. It's so brief that it doesn't disclose the important things that can be red flagged. Uh, but, but are they, so they're supposed to fill in one of these forms? I mean, In the United States, Hillsong is exempt from filing a 990. There's another okay. form that they are required to file if they have unrelated business income of over $1,000. And that's the form 990T. And the 990T is for taxable income from unrelated business income. So if you have money coming okay. into your organization for th- something that's not related to the nonprofit's mission, it can be taxable. For example, a church, they own a parking garage and the church lets other uh, people park in there and pay to park during the week when they don't have church services. That's unrelated business income. First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas, they actually own a parking garage and they report it on a 990T and it's taxable income. A lot of people don't know that. Another mega church in the United States, Gateway Church, I believe they have a cell phone tower on their property. Money from that goes um, to the church and they pay a tax on it. It's reported on a 990T. And what's ironic to me is Hillsong also gets revenue from a cell phone tower. And there's no Uh, record of them ever filing a 990T. So Hillsong- Not one ever? I've not found a single 990T for Hillsong. And and this is just one example of unrelated business income. We know that Hillsong has at least two studios in the United States, one in California and one in Nashville. And so Hillsong, they're generating money from their Hillsong United, from their bands, from their recordings, et cetera. But are outside musicians using their studios? It's one of those things we don't know. But again, they could have outside revenue. For example, what if one of the Hillsong musicians wants to record a separate album? If, if they use Hillsong studio to record their own album, and it's not released through Hillsong, are they paying for use of the studio? Uh, There's all kinds of ways of of having unrelated business income. There's rental income. There is, Hillsong owns, or not owns, they have a $1 million investment in office building in New York City. And remember them? That should be taxable income, possibly. I mean, that should possibly taxable income. Again, are they filing a 990T for that? In my opinion, they should disclose with a 990T. And then uh, you found, um, you actually found more two palms uh, using deductible income for operating expenses again, yeah? Two Palm Studios appears to be located in California. Uh, Two of Brian Houston's sons live over there. Joel Houston uh, has played a big role in Hillsong's music for years. And... Hillsong in Australia has paid for studio expenses for Two Palm Studios. What's interesting is when you look at the company documents, it's registered in the California Secretary of State. So when you create a corporation or company in different states in the United States, you generally have to file with um, the Secretary of State website. You have to leave a contact. uh, and, And in the case of Two Palm Studios, they have a manager and there's when you read it there's no indication from this um, document that the studio belongs to Hillsong so could it be a privately owned studio it's one of those things of where mm-hmm. we know Hillsong paid the expenses but the proof that it's owned by Hillsong is questionable how is this all allowed to uh, just kind of be when, uh, when it comes to the gift stuff in terms of these honoraria 
is the plural of honorarium. Yes. What are the rules there in terms of, you know, whether Brian's having a tour of America picking up honoraria or whether, you know, you guys are sending some uh, representatives out here? How, do, how does tax work on an international level and, and how do you keep it in check? Honorariums are heavily abused. In 2007, Trinity Foundation, who I work for, Trinity Foundation contacted um, Senator Grassley, Charles Grassley. It led to a Senate inquiry. What we wanted was congressional hearings. We wanted Senator Grassley to subpoena televangelists and require them to testify before Congress about the spending in these organizations. We wanted to use that to highlight abuses by these organizations. Senator Grassley failed to subpoena them and require them to testify, which is a big disappointment. Our goal was to have had this exposed and have a national conversation about these abuses years ago. It didn't turn out the way we wanted it to. Big disappointment. So there's not been a national debate in the United States about the abuses of honorariums. We know from informants that there's serious problems. They go way beyond Hillsong. There was a huge scandal years ago at Oral Roberts University. On the day of a planned audit, the senior accountant for the university was fired. He claimed to be asking um, questions, suspicious questions. Not the questions weren't suspicious, but he was asking questions about an unrestricted account he had found with huge amounts of money flowing through it. And they gave a fictitious reason for suing him, according to his lawsuit. So in his lawsuit, with Oral Roberts University, he claimed that over a billion dollars flowed annually through this unrestricted account. That's a huge amount of money. And so how would that work? We wanted to find out. I talked to an informant who was not the senior accountant, but a different person. And this person told me he learned that there was a large amount of money flowing through the organization, the form of honorariums. That's just one piece of the puzzle. It, I mean, the, the lawsuit later ended. It, I mean, it, it's a long story, but that's just one example of honorarium mm-hmm. abuses from what we've heard from informants. There's a church, a mega church here in the United States, who a pastor often gives twenty five to $50,000 in honorariums to guest preachers. I'm not going to say the, the church or the pastor's name. It's part mm-hmm. of an ongoing investigation. So, I mean, this is just one more data point. What we know is there are reciprocal agreements between different organizations. A a crazy example is this, and this is not an honorarium, but it's a donation. And Kenneth Copeland, his organization will give a donation to another organization. (laughs) And then that organization gives a donation back to his organization. And they call it a seed twice sown. (gasps) it's crazy. But once you understand the principles of how these reciprocal donations work, it's similar principles with reciprocal honorariums. A pastor will often host a conference. They'll bring in a guest speaker, uh, someone that is a semi-celebrity in Christian circles. People will be interested in hearing this person speak. So they bring in a guest speaker. They'll sell tickets. And they'll pay a large amount of money for this guest speaker. Then that guest speaker has his own conference. He invites his guest host to speak at his own conference. So often the honorariums go not to the organization, but to the person. Uh, We know that in Hillsong, often it would go to a charity of the speaker. So Brian right. and Bobby Houston would have their own separate ministries. Honorarium would go to their ministry. And, ah, then, and, and Phil has his life adventure, wild time charity. Correct. Okay, that he, right. Correct. How do they access that so easily personally? Well, what happens is you can be paid through your um, nonprofit organization, your ministry. In the United States, some of the televangelists will set up a, a separate organization They'll be able to charge their church or ministry consulting fees. Carl Lentz's father, his dad, Stephen Lentz, 
wrote a book, The Business of Church, and he outlines how copyright issues work in a church. And he, um, one of the ways it can be set up is that the pastor can own the intellectual property. He can own his own sermons and license them to his church. I mean, that's just crazy to me. Oh. I, I grew up in going to a Baptist church. My dad was a minister, <laughs> but he wasn't the pastor. But if you wanted to buy a, a, an audio cassette years ago of a sermon, you could do that, maybe $2, something like that. Any profit from that went straight to the church. It didn't go back to the pastor. The pastor didn't own the intellectual property rights. Um, that wasn't even an issue. They never even thought about that. Anything, you know, when you just work a regular job and you create something for the company or deliver a program, you don't get the rights to that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So honorariums, they should be taxable and you should report it if it's over $15,000. But I mean, it's tricky because mm -hmm. honorariums should be gifts and it shouldn't necessarily be something extravagant. When you look at some of the state governments in the United States, some of them actually have limits for honorariums for state government employees. They want to try to prevent corruption. And so the limit varies from state to state. And I think that churches need to adopt higher ethical standards. And like in the state of Texas, where I live, uh, government employees are restricted to accepting non-cash items of less than $50 in value. Government employee, can, they cannot get anything of over $50 in value as a, a gift. But it, these guys who... Their, their contribution is debatable, what they just, how does this all get moved around and that's okay with everyone or, or they just fail to declare and who do we blame? I mean, it's... so um, years ago, the IRS commissioner in the United States, well, the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, they're the tax agency in the United States. The commissioner who headed the organization, he answered a number of questions from Congress. And one of the things he said was, because churches do not report because they don't file 990s. I'm not talking about the 990T. I'm talking about the 990, which are different forms. Okay. They don't know when diversion of assets takes place. And there needs to be better reporting for religious organizations. In my opinion, that's the only way you'll be able to change this is you wow. have to have better reporting requirements. Number one, you need to have donor responsibility. Donors really need to check out the organizations they give money to. I was looking at Hillsong in Australia. The Australian Charity and Nonprofit Commission has a website, and you can look up some basic financial information for some of these organizations. But again, churches are exempt from some of the reporting requirements. So yeah. I was trying yeah. to find out how much they spent on overseas missions expenditures. It's like a black hole trying to find that information there. Donors should ask for more information. Yeah, they really totally. Should. Uh, it's incredible, even murmurs from people that are still attending Hillsong are that, well, you know, those documents are false or there's a lot of change we had and, and things are, are getting better. I mean, I don't know. Did you get a chance to listen to their information night from the other uh, night, their kind I've of listened, response to all this? I've listened to part of it. Hillsong, after this, this new whistleblower documents, well, actually before they mm -hmm. were made public, Hillsong had to address a number of key issues. Um, an investigation was be begun a, like a, at least a year ago. And Hillsong was in the process of answering a number of questions when the whistleblower documents were made public. Okay. So they were already doing it or were they were doing it because they kind of sensed that something was afoot, you think? Well, I don't know how much your listeners know about um, what recently happened. There was this meeting where it was for Hillsong attendees. They wanted everybody to keep this information to themselves, not Oh, yeah. it, share it publicly. Someone secretly recorded it and it's now available online. They had a guest speaker 
Murray Baird, B-A-I-R-D. Murray was the assistant commissioner of the Australian Charity and Nonprofit Commission. He was an expert on the tax code, on the, the laws governing nonprofit organizations. And Hillsong has paid him to represent them, to advise them on the issues that they're dealing with. Because he's an expert on these topics, he is very qualified to review the governance of Hillsong and related issues. He, he recommended five things for Hillsong to do. Mm-hmm. To, one of the things was to make some board member changes. So they didn't remove everybody on the board, but um, a number of people um, have left the board that were previously there. He recommended keeping a few because you would have people that understood previous decisions. It would be wise to have some people with previous experience, but you want new people to bring in who may not be tied to the past to make some of the mm-hmm. difficult decisions, et cetera. A new global strategy for the organization. In the course of this, he did a governance review of the organization. Also, Hillsong, they paid an auditing company, um, Grant Grant Thornton. It was Grant a, Thornton. It was younger yes. Brother, right? Yes, Grant Thornton. That's the name. Grant Thornton also did a review. I don't know if you'd call it an audit, but they reviewed some of the spending at Hillsong, et cetera. According to Murray, they just completed their report, and the, the report exonerated Hillsong. They did not find that the organization had these governance failures. And I would say that is a sign of a cover-up. That's what it looks like to me. It looks like a cover-up. It reminds me of the Senator Grassley inquiry years ago when Senator Grassley had his office send faxes to six TV ministries demanding their financial records. One of them was televangelist Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn responded by hiring two former IRS commissioners just like okay. Hillsong hired or retained Murray Baird. Uh, same thing. Mm-hmm. Also, Benny Hinn made some cosmetic changes to his organization. He got some new board members. But in my opinion, the abuses continued. I think what Hillsong is doing, I think you're going to have to get rid of more people. I think that the current head of Hillsong Global needs to go. And that's Hester what? Hillsong London, right? Oh, well, is it? I mean, I think he is. I think he's been given that title, but I'm like, no, no, no. His title is Hillsong Global Senior Pastor, right? So it may not be uh, head of the board, the... but he's the head right, global right. senior pastor. But I mean, mm. uh, Dooley, I, I think, is has some of the same actions that discrediting that, that Brian Houston did. The Bible teaches that uh, church leaders, they should be above reproach. I mean, you shouldn't even have scandal in your background. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. they, the Bible calls for a very high standard. I mean, it prohibits church leaders from being lovers of money. You can't be greedy. And when you mm-hmm. look at how some of the Hillsong people have operated, it looks like greed to me. Oh, it looks like kind of unbridled uninterrupted just gluttony of greed and every seven sin that Brad Pitt could come up with. I just, it's, 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 it's gobsmacking. And I mean, uh, the new guy is supposed to be the great change, uh, the new way forward, but you know, the same things are still happening. Yeah. Phil Dooley has to uh, raise his own standards. I mean, I think what happens is when you get embarrassed with um, some of the documents, things that have been disclosed, you probably realize, you know what, it wasn't a wise decision for what I did in the past. And he might be less likely to do it in the future. That I don't know. But Hillsong is a damaged brand. Mm -hmm. The church leadership, a number of the problematic people are gone now. And um, not just the Houstons, but some of the other board members. But again, you need to have a culture of honesty and transparency. And Hillsong has a culture of gift giving. It has a... Oh, yeah. 
culture of extensive travel of leaders, a culture of providing meals for employees, paying for those meals. And, and all, there's all kinds of abuses that can take place there. I mean, there are very large meal expenses in, in the whistleblower documents. There's expensive oh, yeah. hotel rooms, expensive travel tickets. I mean, the, the Houston spent over half a million dollars in travel in one year. Brian and, and yeah. Bobby Houston, over half a million dollars yeah. in Australian dollars in traveling one year. That's just wild. And how would that compare with, I mean, I don't know, because all we do is see the excesses of, you know, the, the kind of portrayals of excess of the American megachurch pastor. I mean, how does it kind of compare with everybody else? Are they just normal in that world as we try to make, kind of sense of all this it, it's hard to know because 990s they have an overview like on the statement of expenses page for a 990 it'll have travel expense but you don't okay. uh, you don't have a, a line item for a bunch of these expenses so you don't know where all that money went now there are a number of religious um, nonprofits in America that have jets, churches and ministries. And when they have a jet, they're going to often have very large travel expenses. I was looking at one organization, I think it was Samaritan's Purse, that in one year they had almost $8 million in travel expenses. So that would be wow. almost twice as much as what Hillsong reported in one year. Which is just incredible because they build all these buildings and these churches and then like never hang around to be in them. In the case of Hillsong, Hillsong, they rented a number of buildings, um, theaters for holding Sunday meetings. So they didn't have to pay for a lot of the building upkeep. They did have property in okay. um, ah. the Phoenix area, Phoenix, Arizona area. Uh, and in Australia, they ha have a number of buildings, but in, in other countries, they often um, would rent a theater. I don't know. What's next? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so That's honorariums, crazy. that is one of the uh, big abuses. It's a way of becoming rich, enriching yourselves through donor funds. And I think that if more of honorarium abuses are exposed, only then would governments be, um, politicians be willing to address the issues. Again, ultimately, politicians are the ones writing the tax code of nations. And so... Right. I, I mean, because it all sounds, you know, every time we kind of take a, a deeper dive into this, it all sounds a little bit depressing. You know, they're kind of just you know, dancing around the old golden calf and nobody's doing anything about it, even though it's illegal. So, like, what's the point of all these laws and government bodies? Certainly in our country, it's been a real wake-up call to, you know, see how kind of toothless or, or sort of slow to respond or, you know, so much can be gotten away with while the investigation's starting, you know, keep thinking like if it were anybody else. So if, you know, if you accused your next door neighbour of assault or something like that, they could be bail refused, but these guys are still travelling around and having a good old time. And it, what do we kind of do with all this, these system flaws and, and loopholes and how are we supposed yeah. to feel, I guess? As well? There are... There are a lot of opportunities for reporters to do serious investigative work. There's a Bible verse in Ephesians chapter 5, basically about exposing darkness, bring it into light and its true nature is revealed. I'm sort of paraphrasing. But I believe the Bible justifies Christian investigative reporting. I mean, you, you need to see the Christian Post, Christianity Today, and other religious organizations take a stronger lead in investigating these issues. You need church denominations that have their own news website. They need to do their own investigating. It's best to do your own investigating rather than waiting for someone else to do your job for you. Yeah. Th that's one of the things is that donors need to be educated about how to find financial information. In the United States, mm -hmm. there are a couple of websites like um, there's guidestar.org. There is ProPublica. They have a nonprofit search 
section on their website, the Internal Revenue Service, they have an exempt tax search as well. And so in these websites, you can search for nonprofit organizations. Again, churches are exempt, but you can often look and find a 990 form. And then you can look at the statement of expenses page and statement of revenue page and see how much money's coming in and sort of idea of where it's going. You need to have churches provide a financial statement at the end of the year detailing where the money's going. The, the church my dad worked at, we had a monthly business meetings. The members of the church would vote on how the money was spent. We had a financial statement every month. You talk about a church that was very financially transparent. My dad's salary was disclosed there when they would adopt a new a budget mm-hmm. each year. My dad's salary was listed right there. It was a matter of public knowledge, public information for the attendees of the church. You need to see more Christians raise their standards. And fortunately, we're having a trend of churches rejecting transparency and ministries rejecting transparency. Recently, some big organizations in the United States have decided to obtain church status so they don't have to follow 990. Um, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, they no longer follow 990. Gospel for Asia, they do not follow 990. I mean, there's a number of the organizations that don't file. Lifestyle Christianity, they stop filing after being reclassified. So we need to curtail this trend. But donors need to be educated. Here's what to look for. If you see large attorney expenses, well, maybe there's a lawsuit. Maybe they're trying to prevent a lawsuit. I mean, yes. those are the kind yeah. of things people need to look for in a financial statement or a 990. You need to look at how much a person's paid. Is it excessive? In the corporate world, in the United States, for publicly invested corporations, public stocks, whatever, they have to report to the Securities and Exchange Commission. And one of the documents they file each year discloses CEO pay ratio. So... How much is the CEO paid compared to the average employee? I mean, you've got companies where a CEO will be paid 20 times more than an employee. You know what? There's some churches that are probably like that. Well, I mean, and therein lies the difference. Hey, I mean, it's a free world, free market, make your way. But how do you justify making your way on the taxpayer's dime and on other people's good faith and hard work donated. It's it's just next level. It's uh... Yeah. Another thing is you need to see Christians reject the prosperity gospel. Mm-hmm. That needs to be a red flag. If someone preaches the prosperity gospel, you do not give them any money. That mm. needs to be common practice in a church, but it isn't. It's just like the examples you're giving, like of your hometown church with your dad and stuff like if people don't know that what what good looks like, you know, it's good to see an example of what things are supposed to be. Or, you know, maybe are there any churches that put in these 990T? I mean, there are churches that file both. So the 990, again, they're not required to file a 990, but it's uh-huh. voluntary. The 990T is totally different. If you have over $1,000 in unrelated business income, you should file. Now, there are certain exceptions, but again... Uh, I think it's just best common practice to follow 990T. But on a 990 form, on the very first page of a regular 990, there is a line for unrelated business income. One of the things that we know is that a number of televangelists have operated for-profit companies from their church. Think about Hillsong. Hillsong could be running for-profit companies from their churches. And the laws are the same where you are. You're not allowed to use that tax deductible earned or the the money that's earned from donations for operating expenses and trips to Mexico or like how does that work? In the in the US there are reporting requirements for when money goes overseas. There is a document that's supposed to be filed with the Treasury Department if over I think it's ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars or more goes overseas. A certain cr- a form is supposed to be filed. It's separate from a nine ninety. And um, the thing is, a lot of bookkeepers may not even know this law exists. I, I think you need better financial education in the church world. When I worked in retail, I worked for 
couple of office supply companies and we had training videos the employees watched. And one of the reasons for these videos was to counter employee theft. It's a serious problem in big business. It's also a problem in churches, but in the in, yeah. the, bus- in the business world, we'd watch these videos, and it would it would tell us if you see something suspicious, report it. So, like companies like Office Depot, Staples, um, Walmart, they would have loss prevention officers, people that try to prevent the loss of assets, and they would visit the stores to audit them to make sure that things were properly secured in the store. Certain mm-hmm. items that were easily stolen would need to be secured, locked up, etc. But they also, they'd be a type of person to call if you suspect an employee of theft, coworker, or manager. And um, they could come in and investigate the manager if you suspect the manager of stealing. In the church world, we don't have that kind of system set up. If somebody's stealing from your local church, normally you don't have a person to go call. Can you come investigate this pastor for a theft? Oh, yeah. I mean, they don't seem to seem to want to. They seem to want the direct opposite as well. Barry, are you are uh, willing to share any of the articles that you're researching at the moment? So we can look forward um, to it. some of the things I'm working on. One of them is an article about Hillsong travel expenses, an overview of it, which I'm one of the things I mentioned earlier in this conversation was that Brian and Bobby Houston spent over half a million dollars in mm-hmm. travel expenses in one year. That included ticket for, for airplane flights and charter airplane service. So, and that's in over half a million dollars in Australian dollars. Another article I'm working on is about governance of the organization. Um, It will get into the LLCs, the limited liability companies, and how they're used for asset protection. Another topic Mm -hmm. I'm going to be addressing is the Hillsong strategy for dealing with the current investigation in Australia. And part of that is what we've already seen with the recent meeting was the messaging, uh, that basically um, them denying that they really have a major governance failure. I mean, the hiring of a former assistant commissioner and doing these things to um, staff up to fight, protect themselves from a, an investigation. I think donors need to know how churches can be involved in a cover-up. One of the ways you a church can participate in a cover-up is if they deliberately work to silence a whistleblower. Now, they're in Australia and in the United States, there are certain whistleblower laws, protect whistleblowers. Yeah. But uh, we know that um, often in these cases, there's litigation. And when there's litigation and behind closed doors, it's not transparent. Mm. In the United States and in Australia, it'll often go before an arbitrator. And what happens in arbitration is, for the most part, very secret. We need to have a more open arbitration process. But how do you get there without changing the laws? I mean, you probably at some point, people need to start lobbying their representatives if they want a more transparent society. All seems kind of so far away and yet so, like it's all still carrying on. And Thank you. Thank you so much for spelling it out. Where can we find these articles when we're looking for you? I'm writing for Trinity Foundation, also Mm -hmm. assisting a journalist at the Christian Post. I'll be providing information to several other journalists, including one in the UK. Hold on. In the next two weeks, you're going to see probably a number of disclosures, (laughs) big ones. Oh. From my goal as a journalist and investigator is to explain the big picture. I call it mm-hmm. explanatory journalism, explanatory reporting. As a journalist or investigator, I want to answer the who, what, when, where, how, and why questions. A lot of the recent reporting on the whistleblower documents primarily focuses on big tickets or unusual spending items. Right. But I'm interested in explaining what are the laws governing these things? What laws have been broken? Is this a common Terrific. practice? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it hasn't reached my house yet. Did it reach yours? I mean, <sighs> um, 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You'll stay in touch with us. I really, really appreciate your time and your wisdom and your eagle eyes over all of this. I mean, I'm guessing there's, you know, lots more that is going to come out of these papers as well. I mean, there will probably be a number of other disclosures over the next two weeks. But the one thing that really has not been reported on by the news media, for the most part, has been the possibility of tax evasion and the failure to mm-hmm. file a 990T. So that's going to be mm-hmm. one of the big developments that you'll be seeing in the near future. And what are the penalties for that? I mean, is, is there anything real going to come of this? The way the, the, the laws are in the United States, when a complaint is submitted to the IRS, you have to have two ranking officials approve a church audit. So there's the Church Audit Procedures Act, which regulates this. They have two years to wrap up a church investigation. They can go to court to have it extended if they need more time. And once they launch an investigation or audit, that's generally confidential. I mean, unless they end up filing criminal charges, which then you'd have to go to before a grand jury, I think, for an indictment. That doesn't happen that frequently. There was one televangelist in the past 10 years that's been convicted of tax evasion. He was an idiot. The IRS gave him (laughs) an opportunity to pay his taxes. And Todd Koontz defied the IRS, refused to pay, and he's now in prison for it. The IRS, what would happen in the United States is that The IRS would probably do an audit. I mean, possibly do an audit. They have had a loss in the number of employees over the past couple of years, especially during the COVID era. So um, they're poorly staffed right now. And I think it's not a high priority at the IRS to investigate or audit churches. I don't, there's no evidence it's a priority for them. So if they were to launch an audit, they would probably say, um, we found these, uh, that you owe these taxes. They'd probably have some penalties slapped on. Church would probably pay it. And then they probably start filing a 990T. That's probably Mm -hmm. something that would happen. We'll wait and see. I mean, when the news articles come out, it'll then become common knowledge to uh, more people that what the tax laws are. And it's possible a number of people in Hillsong in Australia don't know what the tax laws are in the U.S. They're going to have to be educated. Mm -hmm. You're doing business here. Well, you need to know the law. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for going to all the trouble and for doing this work and making it accessible to anybody online. It's just fantastic that it's out there. A lot of hard work. I appreciate it, Barry. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad to always talk to you. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Thanks a bunch. Bye. 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 Well, I hope that really provided you with a completely different side uh, of the globe of what the expectations are. Even in the midst of all that kind of huge world of huge, huge ministries and companies and mega churches, there's stricter laws. It's something Australia might want to have a think about. Thank you so much for tuning in and downloading and listening along to Leaving Hillsong with us. You are super appreciated. A huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much. You are making this possible more than you can imagine. And if you want to join them and be one of those patrons, please. Feel free to sign up to Leaving Hillsong Patreon. There's a PayPal account. Head on over. It would really, really help. Like your messages and your likes and your follows and your comments. It all goes in. It's all super useful. So please keep it up. Share this episode with someone that you think might find it useful. There are so many different... um, the ways that people receive the information or different things that they react to uh, or, or are interested in. So do what you will. Keep liking, sharing, subscribing. Keep being kind to yourself. I mean, these people are super kind to them, so don't hold back. So, you know, do something a little nice extra for you. Be kind to the person next to you. Get them a Louis Vuitton bag like just do it. Like just put it on the card. It'll be fine. 
do what you can to keep leaving Hillsong as quick as you can in every way you can. And we'll talk soon. Bye.